We have actually exported this, this distinction all around the world in the way we've done missions. Leslie New, Newbigin said that Christian miss, missionaries have been one of the most secularizing forces in the entire world. We've gone into third world context, and you know what we've told them? We've told them it's not spirits who make the crops grow, it's scientific agriculture. So we got fertilizers and fungicides and pesticides and hybrid seed, and we showed them their religion has nothing to do with agriculture. It belongs in the realm of science. What we should have said is this is a God-created and God-sustained world, and he has designed ways for this world to operate, and we experience the most, the best of his gifts in this world when we operate according to the way he has designed it. And so we seek him, and we, we work in the context of how he, as a perfect designer in this world, has made us. But we disconnected the two. And as a result, we see no need in our lives on a daily basis for the supernatural power of God. We even reduce sin to psychopathy and psychological problems that need to be dealt with in the context of social environments. And we miss out on, on the spiritual world around us. And then some even say spiritual powers are not prevalent in Scripture. And what I want to show you tonight in the Bible is that the there's an active, prevalent, pervasive spiritual world all over Scripture from the very beginning, Genesis 3, with the fall of man, to the middle with Jesus in Matthew 4, to the very end, Revelation chapter 20, when Satan is judged. Catch this. If you do not believe in the spiritual world, then you are denying the reality of the Bible. Even deeper, if you deny that there is a spiritual world around us, you are denying the truthfulness of Jesus Christ himself because Christ was inundated in the spiritual world from the very beginning. An angel announced his consummation as well as his birth. He was tempted by the devil, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. He was served by angels after his temptation. He could have called down legions of angels from the cross. Angels were present at the tomb when the stone was rolled away. They were present when he ascended into heaven. To undermine the reality of the spiritual world is to undermine the very reality of the birth, life, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ himself. So spiritualities are pervasive. We need to avoid two errors here. C.S. Lewis talked about it. There are two equal and opposite areas into our, which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or magician with the same delight. Error number one is empty rationalism. Either to deny the spiritual world as religious fancy or to compartmentalize it. And this is where we need to realize, particularly in this room, in this context, that we are far more secularistic, humanistic, and materialistic than we would like to think. And we tend toward this. Empty rationalism. The other extreme to avoid, though, is an excessive fanatic fanaticism. Yes, there are spiritual realities, but if we're not careful, we will overanalyze them and overreact to the spiritual world, causing all kinds of misunderstanding and misconception. I want to be point blank honest here. After studying this for months and preparing for tonight, I am convinced that there is all kinds of fiction, superstition, fantasy, nonsense, nuttiness, and downright heresy when it comes to ideas about spiritual warfare in Christian circles. And we need to be careful. Yes, not to confine ourselves to an empty rationalism that ignores the spiritual world, but we also need to be careful not to indulge ourselves in excessive fanaticism. David Powelson wrote a great book on counseling as it relates to spiritual warfare. I wrote it, I've got it in the recommendations in the back. I want you to listen to what he said. I just want to read you a little excerpt. He said, some people really do see a demon behind every bush. Cynthia, a woman I counseled, once cast demons out of her toaster when it failed to work. More seriously, she and her husband Andrew had a remarkable and remarkably destructive way of arguing with each other. For the first five minutes, they warmed up with normal person-to-person -person bickering. But at a certain point, when the fighting turned nasty, they shifted gears and wheeled in heavier artillery. They would bind, rebuke, and attempt to cast out demons of anger, pride, and self-righteousness from each other. In Cynthia's words, I saw the demon looking out of his eyes, glittering and murderous. So I said, demon of anger, I bind your power in Jesus' name. Then I claimed the power of Jesus' blood as my cover from all my demonic assault coming through my husband. 
The result, he said, not only did Cynthia and Andrew reinforce their hostility, they trampled the name of Christ through the mud of their superstition, hostility, fear, and confusion. Needless to say, the real devil who aims to dishonor God and conform us to his evil ways could only be pleased at the personal and interpersonal wreckage he brought about in this situation. I want want us to study this very honestly tonight because I am convinced that there's a great deal of confusion in the church here and around the world regarding spiritual warfare. And we, we need to stay away from both of these two extremes, both of these errors. Foundational truth number one, there's a spiritual world. Number two, we are involved in a spiritual war. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is a war of conflicting kingdoms. We've already looked at this package, passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The picture is there is a kingdom of God and a kingdom of Satan. Jesus talks about how his kingdom is not of this world in John 18. Ephesians 2 talks about the ruler of the kingdom of the air. There's a kingdom of God that coexists with the kingdom of darkness, and it is not a peaceful coexistence. There's tension there. And history is the story of this tension. We need to realize that from the very beginning, the Bible, the very beginning of human history, it is a drama of war and peace and conflicting kingdoms from Genesis 3 on. And in the middle of pagan nations following after the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the God of this age, little g-god devil, God calls out a people to himself to be a light in the middle of darkness. And yet even the most bright lights among his people still fall. Abraham still deceives and lies. And Moses still struggles with unbelief and he dies. And Noah, who had faith in God when no one else did, still gets drunk and he dies. David, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery and organizes murder and he dies and over and over and over again you see the brightest lights among the people of God still infiltrated with darkness until we get to the perfect man and he comes on the scene and there is no sin in him And he conquers with his life. He conquers with his death. He conquers with his resurrection. He shows us the kingdom of light so that all who trust in him can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light through him. But even those who trust in him still, still have a sinful nature that wars within them. And the conflict continues. And yes, there's coming a day when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of Christ and he will reign forever. But at this moment, we find ourselves in war. It is a continual struggle. I just want you to think real quickly with me about how the New Testament pictures the Christian life as warfare. It is a war against sin, Hebrews chapter 12. And the struggle against sin, it's a war within our souls, 1 Peter 2, a war against your soul, Struggle against sin, a war within our souls. We struggle for our faith. Jude 3 talks about how we have to contend for our faith. We have to fight for it. We struggle for the gospel, Philippians chapter 1. Going through the same struggle you saw that I had in the gospel. 1 Timothy 6, Paul says we fight the good fight. Paul comes to the end of his life and ministry and he writes in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. That sums up my life, fought. Kept the faith. He says to New Testament Christians in that same book, we are soldiers. Endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We are soldiers. The New Testament talks about how we have weapons. The weapons we fight with, not the weapons of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in the middle of that passage, Paul talks about weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left. And then, back in the Old Testament, this is a passage we're going to look at a little bit later. War is raging in the heavenlies. In this picture, Daniel's prayers are affecting an entire battle between angels that is going on in the heavenly realms. The point is, we are in wartime, not peace time. We need to realize this. We are in wartime, not peace time. 
This is why Paul says in Ephesians 6, kind of a passage we're going to come back to over and over and over again, our struggle, and this shocks me, Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical struggle. And you think about what he had been through physically. He'd been stoned and beaten and harassed and abused and imprisoned and shipwrecked. If anybody knew this was a physical struggle, that's not what Paul says. He says that's not where the struggle is. Not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the authorities of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a spiritual war. And what's going on in the spiritual realm is far deeper, far more meaningful, far more impactful than even what's going on in the physical world. Let this soak in. 